afternoon and good evening to friends and colleagues. It is my great pleasure to be in conversation with my mentor, colleague, and most of all, I'm honoured to know Professor Jean-Pierre Michel as a friend. Jean-Pierre is the father and grandfather of geriatric medicine. And as you can appreciate, he receives many, many invitations from all over the world to present keynote lectures. And just recently in Japan and China. His bio is extensive and substantive as you would expect. But, you know, in that there is a quality of humility which is coupled with just unconditional sharing of knowledge and a continued zest for learning. Jean-Pierre has authored over 400 scientific papers, authored numerous books, book chapters, and co-edited the Oxford Textbook of Geriatric Medicine and the International Textbook of Geriatrics. He's the, I think he's still the editor-in-chief of the uh, EU GMS, a journal named uh, European Geriatric Medicine. Um, Jean-Pierre, um, welcome. And I feel very privileged that we're in conversation today where we often have cups of tea at meetings and, and try and solve the problems of the world or at least think about the problems of the world. So it's a great honour to have you with us today. Um, Jean-Pierre, I said that you didn't have to wear a tie, um, but um, you look very distinguished and that's what I would expect of you. I did not um, notice the jacket. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's 40 degrees and, uh, um, but, but, you know, it, it is a great honour. But I want to start, Jean-Pierre, with way back, Way back, what attracted to you to geriatrics some 40 years ago and how has this role changed over time? Thank you very much, uh, Jane, for welcoming me. I'm very pleased to be with you, all my friends. And I think that uh, I have to try to answer your question, which is very easy for me and very funny for me. So um, I was, I am French and now I am French and Swiss. And uh, I was, um, professor of, of uh, medicine at the age of less than 31 in France, professor of internal medicine. And I was in Limoges. And a few days after my promotion, uh, the dean of the University of, Gen of Limoges got one invitation to participate in the launch of the third age university in Limoges. For this reason, uh, he said to me, I am, no, I am not involved in this. I am a surgeon. And my vice dean, who is uh, your boss, uh, dislike all people. And the oldest surgeon will not like to go there. So uh, can you go there as you are the youngest professor in our university? So I said, yes, indeed. I was so pleased to be as uh, honored to be in this uh, uh, council. So I went there and really my first, um, feeling was very bad. Uh, people were very old, they were dis dis uh, disabled, they were not so highly, cognitively high, cognitively high. So I, I was very disturbed by this meeting. And then at the end, I, I was in touch with Meyer of Limoges, the president of the medical uh, colleagues of Limoges, with uh, the president of uh, the Third Age University, so, uh, and they asked me a lot of questions, many, many, many questions, and I did not know how to answer them because until now, until the age of 31, I did not have any idea of what was aging and what was the problem of aging. And really, I was so upset that at the end, I told them, you know, I, I, I will I have to tell you that I don't know the answers, but I promise you to do something for geriatric medicine. And during the vacation, I started to go into the textbook and to, to read a lot of papers and to read a lot of papers. And then I saw that this discipline was very good because it was at the same time very holistic, very human, with an interdisciplinary teamwork. So I was attracted by this discipline. And I went back to the dean and told him, 
can you offer me a room to teach geriatric medicine? I, I was really very low knowledge, but I started to teach geriatric medicine. And I was so successful that I had to ask the dean to increase the size of the room. And then the president of the medical doctors of Limoges went to see me and tell me, Jean-Pierre, now you have to go to teach the GPs. And I started teaching the GPs. I got the privilege to, uh, to invite a lot of colleagues who were already in charge of this position in France. And they taught me a lot of things. And I was so successful that uh, after probably eight years, I had I taught more than 800 GPs from the north west part of France. And then I was asked to go to Geneva as professor of geriatric medicine in Geneva. And this discipline is really my discipline. I love it and I'm very proud to be geriatrician. Jean-Pierre, that's a really interesting story, but I really want to ask you now, why are there so few geriatricians? Mm -hmm. what, is, what has happened? I mean, do we not need geriatricians now? Um, and the conventional notion of geriatrician some 40 years ago, has it evolved into something else? Because we're always hearing that there's not enough geriatricians or it's not interesting for... for um, you know, medicos. So how do we how do we understand that? I think that again, your question is very good. When I was professor of internal medicine in France, my my way in France was very simple. I have to go ahead and I will be dean or something else, president of I don't know. But I choose geriatric medicine, which who which was the worst discipline that you can have in Limoges, for example. So when I moved from internal medicine to geriatric medicine, people told me, you are you completely crazy, Jean-Pierre, because, because it was not attractive, it was not organized, it was always one discipline which, which was really a, a, a lower level discipline. So it was very complicated for me to say, yes, I moved from internal medicine to geriatric medicine. But I found my way because I loved what I was doing with the old adult, carrying them. I love how this, the field was very uh, integrating uh, social aspect, environmental aspect, financial aspect. So it was very nice and an holistic approach, as I said before. So I, I was part, I am part of the second generation of geriatrician. And now I think that geriatric medicine move a lot. And not only because uh, we, because there is an increase in the number of old people, but because the discipline seems to be more and more attractive, more and more attractive because we put in it uh, a lot of education, we put in it a lot of research, we put a lot, uh, a lot of technology, we put a lot of things in this discipline, and now we have a lot of new geriatrician, and I think that they are probably the much more uh, train that I was at the beginning of my career in geriatric medicine. You know, I want to go back to, well, I, that's very hopeful. I'm very hopeful. But I want to go back to the role of the general practitioner. Um, the GP is very busy. So what role do they have in promotion and prevention? You know, healthy ageing, what role could they have? So I think that the, 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 the issue is very simple. I think that the GPs have a very, very important role to play. Why? Because they are caring or having contact with people from birth to the very old age. So they can see the trajectory of life. They can see how at the beginning of life we are increasing our capacity and then progressively we are decreasing our capacity to become perhaps one disabled and one are cognitively impaired, but I think that they have all the spectrum of this kind of uh, uh, life. And if uh, uh, if I think that they have a very important role to play to notice from time to time when they see the patient that there was a change that can be modified, that can be 
who can cope with. We, they, they can also identify risk factors to, to try to, to, to decrease them. And so they, they have a very, very important. And at the end of uh, 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 the last part of life, I think that they have very, very important role because they know everyone. They know the spouse, they know the children, they know all the environment, the house, they know how it is. And at that time, they have their, their role is fundamental. So I think that all along the life trajectory, GPs are keys. And it was for this one when in Geneva, or when I was in Limoges, really, I thought that the idea of training GPs was very good not only for them, but also for me, because I learned a lot. Now, you've just come back from Japan and China, um, and you go there to train and educate. So can you give us a sense of, you know, what they're up to in their thinking around geriatrics and geriatricians and, and ageing? Can you just give us a little bit of a, a glimpse about okay, so that? I think that there, is, there are two countries, very different countries in Asia. In in, in China, I will start with China. The problem of decreasing the birth rate and to have only one children per family is a very, very important problem. And it is now, uh, it is now in front of them, in, in front of the Chinese population. So we have one ch child for two parents and four grandchildren. And indeed the pyramid of age is not a pyramid, but it is, Less, has, has a colon without any children. So I think that the problem is fantastically important. And I can say that the government, the Chinese government is doing a lot of efforts to try to attract a lot of people to train, uh, the, to train the, the Chinese uh, people, what is, what, what is, which is very complicated because uh, Chinese is a specific language. They don't understand very well English. So probably it's, it's a lot of problem. So the main issue, which is not so good perhaps, is that they are also attracting a lot of nursing home uh, uh, companies to come to China to solve their problem. And I don't think that it is by building and building nursing homes that the solution is here. So the solution is probably by taking care of uh, people before the mid, at midlife and before their age. Concerning Japan, it is completely different. Japan is in, a, in, in another, another scheme. Uh, Japan has a lot, a lot of old people. It is one of the oldest countries in the world. But I think that uh, they cope with the problem much better. And I have very, they, ha they have a lot of, uh, very a uh, lot of geriatrics and very good colleagues of me that are doing a very good job. And they are not only working on what was the past of geriatric medicine, but it, they were working more and more on technology. They are more and more involving people in the high tech uh, to, to, to help them aging better and also help them to stay at home. But one of the main problem with the Japanese is also that they, have very few young adults to cope with the age population. It's interesting you say that because when we talk about population aging, um, there's many of us that may think about only, you know, the number of older people. What we're not looking at is the whole picture, not only advanced life expectancy, but low birth rate, you know, and the relationship between those working age, those you know, older people that are not working, those younger people. So it's, it's much more complex than just saying a rapidly yeah. aged Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, and I, one yeah, problem yeah. which is very important also is within the age population is to know the balance between healthy aged people and disabled aged people. And I think that the main problem that we have is that life expectancy is increasing in all countries in the world, but healthy life expectancy or disability-free life expectancy is staying at the same level. And it is the main challenge that you will have to face now. And it is a challenge when we think about the increased prevalence of non-communicable diseases, such as you know, heart disease and diabetes and respiratory diseases and and cancers, 
you know, we, we, we need to almost look at this intersection because we know by the time you're about 75, 60% of us will have one or more chronic conditions. And that goes way up, you know, to around 80% as we get older. So, you know, it's this relationship, isn't it? And I want to pull you back to this function. You've mentioned function a number of times and, and you and I um, have had the pleasure of many discussions about function. So I, I will start by the first part of your question. The first part of your question is quite easy. It's quite easy, but quite challenging. Uh, we, we, we will have, we have at the old age, because I'm part of the old uh, people, we have a lot of chronic conditions. But in fact, these chronic conditions did not appear one day to the other. They are based on <laughs> some things that we have difficulty to imagine, but the, the problem of the mother, the pregnancy, the childhood, the, the, child, uh, the, the adolescence hood, the adulthood, all these things are accumulating. And the risk factors are accumulating during the first part of life. And then at that time, there is one revelation of the disease. So I think that, and the disease after that accumulates each other. So there is the problem of the disease. But I think that uh, what I, coming to your second part of question, I think that one of the most important uh, sentence that is contained into the WHO report 2015, which was the first report on health and aging, is the word of Mrs. the president, Mrs. Chang, who said, in fact, LC aging is more important, as more, is not just the absence of disease. LC aging is not just the absence of disease. That is to say that there is a change of paradigm. Instead of speaking of disease, of chronic disease, speaking about the accumulation of disease, e.g. multimobility or polymobility, we are now speaking about functioning. And LC aging is the capacity of developing and maintaining functioning to allow well-being at the old age. And personally, I have two or three chronic diseases. I am multimorbid, but I function very well. And I can say that I am in LC aging, in the LC aging way until when, I don't know, but it's what I am. I'm feeling today. But, but you know, that's an interesting construct, isn't it? You've said, you've shared, you've got, you know, two chronic comorbidities or whatever, but you're, you're healthily aging. And I think that some of us think about this separate. If I've got a chronic condition, then I cannot be aging healthy. And that's not correct. And I think that it's very important because the paradigm change who occurred in 2015, did not pass to the public, did not pass to the healthcare professional. So there is something that is completely stupid because healthy aging functioning at, in good way in healthy in healthy aging in aging is much more important than the accumulation of disease. Mm -hmm. And I think that you you we have to pass this mission functioning well. Yes. And for this, we have to build our capacity and then to maintain them. And one of the crucial points at the time is midlife, 50 to 65. Because at that time, you can see that if the person will have an LC aging functioning well or already a decline. And when you are thinking out of it, I can say that each of us decline our strengths our walking speed, our equilibrium between the age of 45 and 55. It was silent. We did not recognize it, but it is at that time that everything happened. Look, thank you for that. Now, I'm going to take questions as we go, Professor. Um, and Shmuel is with us every week. Um, Shmuel, thank you for being with us in our Global Cafe this morning. Now, Shmuel's question is, how do we ensure healthy ageing for poor and low socioeconomic groups, groups and populations? How, how do we help make that happen? What would you recommend? The, the main problem are 
that we have globally and not concerning financial issues, but globally is that we are people are not thinking that they are aging. And aging appears to 100% of the population. So there is no way. We, get, we die or you live and we are aging if we are living. So this kind of empowerment of all people thinking that they will be once old, very old, is not really in the mind of people. It is not in the spirit of people. They are enjoying day to day, but they are not thinking that they will live longer. And perhaps until 100, 110, 120. And that is one of the main questions. Concerning the problem of social and financial activities, it is exactly the same. I, I, I love, um, I, am, I, am, I am very close to one centenarian in Geneva. This centenarian is extremely rich. I can say that because I will come back to poverty. But he is extremely rich, more than I will never, never be. And this kind of guy is a very poor guy. Why? Because he fought, he fought all fought, fought all along his life with his two children. So they are not calling him, they are not visiting, visiting. He's completely alone at home. And the only contact he has with Frank is me. And I think that he's very rich, but he's very poor. He has no social relationship. Nobody in, the fa in his family taking care of him. Nobody around the family uh, social networks. So it is very poor. So speaking about poverty you now, we can be poor and have problem to live. But if you have the chance to have children, to have social network, it will completely, com com completely com compensate the problem of aging. And it will be, I think that this person could be better than my old friend, something like that. Look, quite true. I want to now just shift the conversation into some of the work that you and I did with the WHO in the development of guidelines, the integrated care of older people, um, ICO. You know a lot about ICO. And I think when we're talking about the UN decade, one of the action areas is long-term care, but also integrated care. So tell us a little bit about ICO and where you see its future. Also, uh, first, the significance of ICOP is integrated care for all people. So it is really a very nice level. This uh, ICOP program, oh, which is, com is integrated into the decade of healthy aging, which follow the health and aging report, is a very nice idea because it project us 10 years later in 2030. And this program is very interesting because it focuses on several points, as you said, uh, James, just now. And I think that uh, what, what is also very important uh, done by WHO is in fact to try to measure what is happening in the world in the aging condition. As you said, poverty, I said life expectancy, healthy life expectancy, but also, uh, friendly city, et cetera, et cetera. So, and long-term care. So, so they are trying not only to push action, but also to measure action and to know if the action that are done all over the world are good or not good, and to try to replicate them in other part of the world. So I think that this example is very useful and important. Within this ICO program, there is within this decade of health aging, there is the ICOP program. And the ICOP program is in fact very interesting because it is a kind of comprehensive geriatric assessment done in another way, the way of WHO, which allow to uh, try identifying into the community people who are frail, pre-frail or frail, and to help them to get back to another stage robustness. And I think that it's very interesting to give them the best care. And for the best care in the way of geriatric medicine, 
it is an interdisciplinary way that we have to use. It is that it's not only the medical doctor who has to be in charge, but it is also all the nurses, all the healthcare professionals, but also the voluntary people who are working with all people, helping them to keep uh, in good shape and functioning well. So uh, I think that it is the way of doing it. And indeed, uh, in this program, we uh, do by spoke uh, of uh, long-term care, but we have to know that long-term care is not only institution, but it is also home long-term care. And for home long-term care, as I said to my centenarian, you need to have a network, a network of informal caregivers who are your friends, your spouse, your friends, your, your spouse, your children, your friends, uh, but also formal caregivers who are the team of professionals working at home. Okay, so we've got ICO. There's another area that we work, you and I work on um, extensively, and we've come together many times on the topic of adult immunisation, and most recently on the beautiful island of San Savolo in Italy. And the topic was really very interesting. It was dementia, ageing, and vaccination. And even just as, um, as late as two days ago, I was at another meeting where there was a lot of discussion. So in brief, what is the science telling us about dementia, vaccination, and ageing? May, may I speak first of vaccination? Because I think that, um, as, as you said before, I, I have been involved in geriatric medicine for 40 years, more than that now. And in fact, at the beginning, nobody used to speak about adult vaccination. And the problem of adult vaccination went probably 20 years ago, but not before. And I think that adult vaccination is a key point because uh, it is really something that and vaccination is something that is the first and the main important issues in public health. And vaccination save a lot of uh, deaths, not only during the COVID pandemic, but before the COVID pandemic. The Dubai way shows that uh, uh, 50 million of deaths were uh, avoided by vaccination in the world during the last life, uh, the 50 years, the last 50 years. So I think that adult vaccination is something very important. And I think that really you have to stress it. And you are really one of the best advocates in the world to promote this kind of adult vaccination. Now, coming back to the idea uh, of uh, linking infectious disease, dementia, and vaccine, I think that this idea is a very old day idea. It worked, it, it started uh, 30 or 25 years ago. And why? Because uh, the first thing is that we, 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 we or the scientists, uh, linked our Epstein-Barr um, Epstein virus and uh, multiple sclerosis. And then a lot of work started in this way. But the debates were always very, very important. Is it possible to link one virus to one disease? And in fact, uh, the meeting that we had uh, in uh, San Severo recently was a meeting which tried to gather all the data that we had on this kind of links. And we had a very nice lecture by Dr. Ferrucci, who is the director of the National Institute of Aging. And this person report one publication that he did in 2023, a very recent publication, based on two very big cohort of uh, people, the UK Biobank and the Finn Biobank. And they discovered that in fact, there was a very close link between infectious disease virus and neurodegenerative diseases, different kind of it. And they found a lot of links. And the two most uh, important uh, virus bacteria who are involved are flu 
and pneumonia. And this discussion was really very, very interesting to know if we can say today that there is a link. And it is not possible to say that. It is not possible to say that, even if we have a lot more and more clues to say that, because there is no real uh, data concerning this kind of uh, link. Why? Because very often, disease appear and infectious disease appear in old young age and dementia in old age. There, there is a gap, a very big gap between the infection and dementia. And it's very complicated to have the link. And there is very, very few data concerning uh, this kind of study. There is one uh, study which was published in 2001 uh, in, uh, in Canada, in Quebec, looking at the cohort of demented patients and respectively, respectively, <laughs> retrospectively, they, they try to know if this person got the vaccination in young age. And they conclude that retrospectively and without any big, uh, big uh, certain uh, conclusion that there is a link between vaccination and the protection against dementia. But we have to wait to go into this way, but it's a very important topic. And I think that today with the COVID pandemics and with the neurological complication and cognitive complication of cognitive disorders after COVID, it is really something that we have to think of and to, to have in mind. And perhaps it's another reason to get the vaccines. May I say that the two most important vaccines that we can promote, that can have to avoid this kind of problem is flu vaccine and also the Mohokal vaccine. It's interesting you mentioned pneumo because that sometimes doesn't get the same attention, you know, as flu. But one, just one further question for my clarification. You talked about dementia. Can you talk about vaccination and heart disease, cardiovascular disease. Heart disease, yeah. yeah. So it, it is exactly the same. It is, it is one main problem. We have thousands and thousands of studies showing that the ring, uh, the, that flu vaccine, for example, have a protective effect against a lot of uh, cardiovascular events, ischemic heart attack, heart failure, death, by cardiovascular disease. We have a lot, a lot of data. But the main problem that we have, and I'm convinced that these data are very interesting, I will tell you one story. The, 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 the problem of this, of, this, uh, of this issue came with one um, in the emergency ward in 1985, 1990s. In the emergency ward, one guy received a lot of patients, all patients, who had sudden death, sudden, sudden death. And he said, I, I will ask uh, this uh, patient and the family if they got the vaccine or not the vaccine, flu vaccine. And at the end, he came with a paper saying, how oh, the people who died from sudden death are not vaccinated while the survivors are vaccinated. It was a very stupid idea in a corner of, you know. and then the idea came. And a lot of studies, as I said before, were published showing that giving, taking a vaccination, and particularly a French study, which was recently published, shows that if you get the vaccine, you have less chance to have bad outcomes or cardiovascular outcomes. You have decreased, you have a lot chances to have strokes. So it's, it's absolutely now proven, but what is, what is the problem is we don't know the mechanisms. And as we don't know the mechanisms, we cannot say that to all one. I can tell you in a, around a cup of tea, but I cannot affirm that uh, I know why it is happening. Well, we're, we're around a cup of tea, so we're, we're pretty safe. I'm going to ask Cynthia Stewart to come forward, and Cynthia is our main representative at the United Nations. So, Cynthia, you're sitting on the deck in Maine. What's your question to uh, Professor Michelle? Well, thank you, first of all, for this 
very enlightening Global Cafe this morning, Professor Michelle. Um, but um, living in the United States, I'm curious on your perspective of a uh, country on a private payer system for its healthcare versus universal coverage. In um, my experience here in the US is we have not been very successful attracting geriatricians and it always comes down to the private payer system and what is being reimbursed. There's the ageism, of course, which you eloquently described, but there's another practicality of what um, insurance companies deem um, appropriate reimbursement for people conduct doing geriatric care. So I just wondered what your, what your perspective on that is. Okay, um, I think that is a very interesting question. I am, I am, I am French, as I told you at the beginning. In France, there is a universal coverage, and it is very, very interesting to have this universal coverage. But however, today we are not. The French government is not so good to cover all the cost of health care of all people. And one of the ideas that uh, emerged. Uh, in the government was to create one fifth branch of what we call the social security to cover all the expenses of dependency. In Switzerland, where I am living today, there is no global government insurance company, insurances, but there is private insurances. But private insurances is mandatory. So we have good coverage of all the population. However, whatever our two systems, French or, or Switzerland, the extra cost linked to dependency is very, very important for the family. And there is something which is also strange, mainly in Switzerland, is that in fact, the problem of there is no, um, barem of uh, prestation for the old people. So the medical doctors who are providing care for all people are not paid as it is more complicated, longer to take care of all people than a consultation with all people to do uh, psychological uh, analysis, cognitive uh, uh, training, etc. So they are not paid for this. And it is a major problem. In your mm -hmm. country, what is surprising is that also the training of geriatrician. In France, as in Switzerland, to be a geriatrician, you need to have three years of training in internal medicine and one year of training in geriatric medicine, including psychogeriatrics. In the state, currently, to go into geriatric medicine is not awarded, as I said before, but it is only one year. So I think that there is a big problem. And Men, more than that, as you say, the costs are, are, not, are not reimbursed, are not covered. So, which is a big, big, big issue. And I think that probably, uh, I, don't, I don't have any idea, but probably as the number of old people is increasing, greatly increasing, I think that it will not be possible to continue in this way. And I think that in some way, uh, we, we have to think that government will have to change their, 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 how they are managing uh, the old people. Because something that I have to, to say, and we are not conscious of it, uh, when you have a votation, when we have any votation, the young people are not voting, but the old people are voting. And the old people are very important part in, in the result of the votation. And they can, in all the countries in the world, completely change the way of the politics. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks. thanks very much, Cynthia. Uh, Jean-Pierre, just recently, you wrote an article with colleagues about the need to move from precision medicine to health precision medicine. Could you help us understand what precision medicine is and what's health precision medicine? So, um, uh, 
precision medicine is a very nice word, which was uh, uh, set up in 1999. So very recent uh, names for uh, something which is very clear. It is in fact to uh, try to have the right diagnosis for the right patient at the right time. And I think that we have to say that precision medicine is really the result of a lot of progress. And it is very important to have this kind of progress. And I was very impressed when I read um, last week that, for example, the uh, Duchenne, this, uh, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy was now, well, is, it is possible to cure this disease, uh, Duchenne dystro muscular dystrophy by a new gene approach. I was very surprised when I am thinking that child with hemophilia can be cured by precision medicine. So it is targeting on specific disease to uh, try to have specific treatment for one patient. Indeed, it is major progress in science, extremely important uh, progress in science. And perhaps we can think that this kind of medicine, precision medicine, based on metabolic comics, uh, on uh, genes, uh, approach, etc., et is, is fundamental and has to be promoted. Yes. But now we have to think differently. We have to think that we have to face a lot of all people. And it is impossible to have this kind of very precise medicine to all the old people. And one of the main challenges that I mentioned at the beginning is to aging well, e.g. to aging with good functioning. Is it the main problem is now to prevent sarcopenia, to prevent pre-frailty, to prevent frailty, to take, to, to, to understand what is the first sign or symptoms of uh, cognitive decline, to try to act as soon as possible to avoid functional decline and dependency in the old age. And for this, there is a new word, which is in parallel of precision medicine. It is public health, uh, public health precision. So, which is very important. And this way of having public health precision is the way of taking the disease much better, uh, um, prior the, in the asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic phase and to try to favor the aging process. And one of the good examples is the new anti-amyloid drugs, which, are, which, uh, which is claimed in all the, the, the newspapers currently. These kind of drugs are not acting on demented people, but of people, when people who are at the very early stage of dementia, and it is active only at this stage. So what we have to think is how we can, by a kind of health monitoring, be able to better understand how the functional decline uh, start, how we can do to modify this uh, decline, to stabilize things, and how we can have the good treatment, appropriate treatment at the beginning. So the two approaches, precision medicine, are targeted for one patient with one precise disease at, at what time, and public health precision medicine is probably to have a broader approach to prevent disability and dependency at old age. You know, Jean-Pierre, you've just given us a masterclass you know, in a few minutes. And, and that's why, you know, you're a mentor to me and to many people around the world because you, you know, if we just think about your journey and you said you've been in this field for some 30 or 40 years, you know, your thinking and your writing has evolved beyond where we are now because, you know, you're always thinking about what is it that we need to be looking at viewing, where's the science, where's the policy? You know, what is it that 
gets you up in the morning to think that way about the future? What what is it? I don't know. <laughs> I think that I love my what I am doing. I love uh, uh, the way of uh, thinking and acting. And I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know, but. I'm not the only one. I think that a lot of colleagues now are exactly in the same way. Look, look, yes and no. I think you're one of those rare human beings that are really pushing, you know, every door. And what you just described about public health precision medicine or 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 thereabouts, you know, is the future. Um, a question though: How do we convince government to invest in this? Because, you know, as Indu Gambia said in the chat box, many doctors are still, GPs, still focused on disease rather than, you know, the social determinants. And how do we convince government? I think that it's not only governments. I think that we have all, um, to think about our peers. Uh, it, it is uh, our colleagues uh, in the different uh, university, medical university around the world. And uh, I think that even in Geneva, I was quite of the only one thinking in this way, because except my 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 fellows. <laughs> but but I think that um, as I said at the beginning of the discussion, uh, geriatric medicine was until now considered as a secondary discipline of medicine why it will be the most promising and the most exciting discipline in the world. Uh, so I think that people have to change the mind. And I spoke about the fact that uh, we have to, uh, to increase the awareness of the aging population for the global world. But I think that we have also to increase the awareness of our colleagues who are teaching medicine for, all, for, for the for the, the new students and the new medical doctors. And the way of teaching is very classical. And I think that the, this kind of uh, global approach is not at all uh, the way that we are doing it now. No, look at- I am thinking about France and Switzerland. I don't know about exactly what is happening in other countries. Look, you certainly, Masinga Kelvin has just said in the chat box, I believe in Africa, we still need to carefully know more about gerontology. And of course, you know, the ageing of the populations in, in Africa is quite different, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't have, you know, a proactive approach, you know, in that region. Do you have any comment about that? I have two comments. The first one is that, uh, or three comments. The first one is, right, there is no problem. One thing that also our government and our politician did not understand very well or cannot look at is that in fact in 2050, in 30 years, 80% of the world population over the age of 65 will be in low and medium resource country. 80% of the 60, 65 plus will be in low and moderate resource country. So it will be a main focus. It is really what we have to work on. And particularly, uh, I'm very proud to be uh, the chairman of the EAGG Federation of Geriatric Education. And we started one teaching activities, which is called EAGG E-Trigger. And this EAGG E-Trigger started for Asia, and we are uh, trying to uh, train all the healthcare professional, uh, not only the MDs, but nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists, nutritionists in Asia, and we are quite successful doing it for two years. And we started this kind of program for Africa, Middle East in on May 25, uh, 23 this year. And I think that we are also, yesterday we had this kind of teaching activities and we gathered 150 participants to train them in gerontology and geriatrics. So I think that it is very important. And something that I have in mind, which is to, in fact, to, to, uh, to, to try also to promote methodology in, methodology in research and methodology in publishing, because the African people, as well as uh, uh, Asian people, has to uh, be more engaged and in research and also 
write more scientific papers to, uh, to, 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 to advertise what they are doing in different and difficult conditions. And Jean-Pierre, uh, Dr. Himadri has just put in the chat box that he benefits, Dr. Madri has benefited from the IADDE trigger. Superb discussion. So I think that that's, um, that's very clear. Now, this is unusual for me, but as a friend and colleague, I'm going to ask you one question before I shift to introducing next week's. We all have failures in our work. And these failures sometimes help us to learn. And I know that we have, you know, young colleagues, you know, on, um, on this global cafe. So perhaps you can think about what's a lesson that you've learned that's actually helped you move forward. Um, because I think we talk about successes a lot, a lot, but I think it's equally important to say, well, we failed at this or I learnt this lesson, but it actually helped me to move further forward. So does anything quickly come to mind? I will say the, the following. Uh, when I was elected in Geneva and full professor of geriatric medicine with a very big department of uh, geriatric medicine, 440 beds, I thought that um, all my colleagues at the University of Geneva will welcome me and say, you are doing good, extra, extra. And in fact, they did not understand what I was doing. And when they started to understand what I was doing, they tried to, 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 to avoid me to go ahead. Because, because I think that it's disturbing what I am saying. It is, that it is disturbing to be at the same time a medical doctor and to, to have this kind of global uh, view on, 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 on geriatric medicine. And what is very surprising is that with years and years, with decades of time, I think that people are changing. They are changing, uh, I don't know why, but politicians are not changing or not, not enough because they think politicians as well as a few of my colleagues that they are not aging and they will not die. And in this way, it's impossible to think that uh, something else will happen after them. So I think that it's the main problem. The main problem that we have to face into the community in which we are living. And somebody spoke before about, uh, Cynthia, I think, spoke about ageism. Ageism is everywhere. And it is also in this kind of issues. Look, certainly. Um, I'm going to take one more question, and I know we're running close to time, but Didier, would you be able to come forward and uh, ask your question to uh, Professor Michelle? Uh, yeah, uh, hello, thank you. I first, uh, I just missed the first uh, minutes of your uh, intervention, so sorry if you spoke about this already, but uh, so uh, at the moment, uh, um, I think that one of the biggest problems that we have concerning uh, uh, healthy longevity is the lack of uh, data and the lack of uh, scientific uh, research. And uh, um, for example, in a, uh, and more, more precisely, not the lack of uh, health data, but uh, not enough sharing of health data. And for example, in uh, France at the moment, uh, um, so uh, when you go to a, a, a pharmacy, you share your health data with a multinational called uh, IGVIA for 50% of the uh, cases, and you are not, uh, um, and uh, the, the researchers in France and in the European Union are not able to, um, to, co to consult this data because it's uh, uh, becoming a private data. So what do you uh, think uh, uh, you or the, and the French authorities could do to uh, really uh, share health data for uh, research for health uh, longevity. And uh, of, of course, uh, there is, uh, I know there is health data hub, uh, for example, but uh, they don't give access to those data. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Perhaps if we can, you know, this is a general question too. This is not targeted to any company. Um, I understand the issue, Didier, but um, um, Jean-Pierre, your thoughts about data and sharing? I think that uh, I think that uh, I'm not uh, completely in accordance with what was said uh, the previous uh, 
as a person who asked me. Uh, as I said, I am part now of the French Academy of Medicine. And when I arrived at the French Academy of Medicine 12 years ago, I was the only one geriatrician. Now we are five geriatricians at the French Academy of Medicine, plus three or three or other colleagues who are doing uh, palliative care or intensive care for, for all people. And we are doing a lot, a lot of research. And when you are looking at the, the publication of our colleagues, as well as of Laga in France and in Europe, the, the, the number of research that is done in uh, geriatric medicine today is outstanding. And not only by geriatricians, but also healthcare professionals, but also allied professionals, as people as doing technical uh, zeon technology, uh, uh, dentistry, et cetera, et cetera. So how we can share the data, it's complicated because I think that the, the data are not collectively, uh, are not collected in the good way. And it is for this reason that probably new technology will help a lot by following uh, the, the old people and by having accumulated data all along our life. And as I said at the beginning, because when we were not that, at the, uh, that, that there at the beginning, I think that we, we need to, to have a long life trajectory of what happened because what is happening at the old age is always the consequences of things, things that is happening before and what, or what is uh, before. And something that I did not say, which is for me one of the key message, if I can say that now, Jane, is that in fact, each of us, have 100% 100, uh, 100 of our genes. 25% of these genes will have a complete and uh, will be the same during all our life and the same expression of our life. But 75% of them will have an, exp uh, an expression which is different and modifiable with time. That is to say that we are speaking a lot of genetics, but the most important in our life is epigenetics. It's the, the, our life in one surrounding, family surrounding, life surrounding, work surrounding, and country surrounding. And this is that we are the actor of our own, uh, or our aging. So it's very complicated to come back to DDAC uh, question, to gather data which are fluctuating with the environment. It is very complicated. And the data that you have to collect to analyze, for example, my trajectory or Jane trajectory has to be extremely wide to be able to know what is the key uh, effect that drives us from one point to the other point. So, Professor Jean-Pierre Michel, um, as I look at thought at the outset, this is an outstanding conversation that we've had from a person with life experiences and expertise, sharing them unconditionally with us, but also with this large dose of humility. You know, you always put knowledge and people before yourself, but I want to celebrate you at this important global cafe. Um, the takeaway message for me, before we transfer to telling you about next week is we are the actor of our aging. And I think that's exactly the message that we can take away throughout the weeks, months and years to come. So I just pause there and introduce our next speaker, Dr. Andrew Sixty, And he will be in conversation with one of our moderators, one of the staff on the future of age tech. Um, Andrew has a vast experience in age well, aging technology and the application, you know, for an older population that goes well beyond Canada. So join with us next week for Dr. Andrew Sixsmith. I want to thank all of the IFA staff and particularly Ashley Patrick for being with us today. And back to you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you for being who you are. You know, humble, expert, experienced, friend, colleague and mentor. Thank you very much, and we will be with you all next week. And Jean-Pierre, I'll see you next in San Zavolo or in Paris. Thank you so much. All right, all the best. Thank Bye. you very much for your listening. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye.